This is, um, this is actually for the uh, UN gentleman. Um, there, there's the ICC and the ICJ. Um, which one handles disputes between nations, and could you give us a little background on what both are doing right now? Sure. The, uh, the ICJ is the International Court of Justice, also known as the World Court. That's the court that handles disputes between nations. The ICC is the International Criminal Court, which is, um, uh, I think, one of the most important developments of recent history, um, uh, that we managed to get an international criminal court um, all these years after uh, so many people campaigned so hard to get one since Nuremberg. Uh, that could deal with disputes around the world and hold individuals criminally accountable under international criminal law. So it deals with um, uh, individuals uh, as distinct from, from the other. Uh, both courts uh, have wonderful websites. I, I see you're online right now, so you can check them out uh, <laughs> to, see what's, uh, to see what's on the docket. Both of them have uh, very active uh, caseloads. The International Criminal Court uh, very much engaged uh, um, with uh, Darfur, Cases from Darfur, cases from uh, Uganda, a number of other uh, cases. But maybe my colleague from political affairs has something to add. Yeah. I just wanted to add that one can't understate the impact of the ICC. Um, never did we think, I'm originally a Canadian diplomat, when we first were pushing this forward, or what we've been pushing it forward, as Craig said, for, for decades, but when I was involved, uh, did we think the impact would be as huge as it is? We now have. Uh, people, militia leaders, uh, rebel leaders who are frightened of the ICC. So this is where you have a chain of accountability and accountability actually has impact. Uh, Joseph Kony uh, is hiding in the jungles of the DRC or in Uganda because he's fr afraid, he's literally afraid because of all of the, the, the atrocities he's committed that he will be pulled before a, a docket, be pulled before the bench in The Hague. Yes, um, years ago, um, my girlfriend, who is Chinese, had an abortion. It was my child. I never really dealt with it until I saw your show. I really wanted to thank you for that. Um, and it was her mother that forced her to do it. Anyway, I was curious uh, what the adaptation for China would be and how the show would have to be changed, which might be appropriate, uh, to reach that nation. I mean, it will come whether it's you know, illegally distributed or if there is a major di distribution. Um, what have your thoughts been on that? I have no idea. That's, uh, that's a really interesting yeah. question. Um, I don't know really what the status is of uh, distribution to China in terms it's of It's already television. there through the internet, of course. Oh, on the internet. Well, but yeah, it'll leave. I, I don't know really what those uh, issues are. I know that there are various issues in terms of censorship and government approval, both in DVD and, and on air, but I don't know really what Universal, NBC Universal's uh, deal is with that territory, if they have a deal, or if there's issues that have cropped up in it, but that's an excellent question. In the future, and this is more of a speculative question, in the future, if we get AI, um, will it necessarily be this conflict-driven AI that, that makes this television so, show so popular? And if it's not, then what are we dealing with? Well, I think that's the question that we all sort of face, and it's probably we've probably face it sooner than we'd like to think about. Um, you know, it's it's a classic sort of trope of science fiction that you know the machines rise up against us, and that's part of our story. It's part of many other tales in this in this genre. And you know, the more profound question may well be: Well, what if they don't rise up against us? But what if they're just alive? And how? What do we do with that? And what does that mean to us? What does it mean to you know, look at something that may not have, um, you know, a bipedal form. You know, if, if we don't create robots that look like us, and you look at a blank wall of computers, and somewhere within those hard drives is something that thinks, and something that feels, and something that has uh, all the definition of personhood that you and I accept as being a person, being conscious, what do we do with that? How do we, how do we feel about that? What does that do to our sense of identity and our sense of self in the, in the universe? And I have no idea what the answer to that question is, but that question may well face us within our lifetimes. You know, we could well deal with that situation at some point, and how we answer that question may be one of the defining moments of, of mankind. So I don't know, but I, I, I sense that it, it looms out there and waits for us. Uh, Laura Rosen, I think we can argue, is probably one of the strongest female characters on television for the last 10 years. Um, Battlestar is one of those rare sci-fi shows I find that has a very large female audience. What's it been like for you to 
of being away, I remember Gina Davis made a joke when she won the Golden Globe, the little girl looked up to her saying she wanted to be the president. So what's it been like with you, with the younger women in the audience and the, and the, and the genre, being a little bit of, you know, we can do anything we want, and Laura Alden kind of helps us with that. It's been uh, an, a privilege, it's been a great responsibility, and it's been very controversial because um, uh, the timing of Laura Roslin's presidency, as we all know, in this country uh, was mirroring the Democratic primaries. And uh, Hillary Clinton, obviously, was running. And I was getting a lot of mail and a lot of questions and a lot of uh, hope sent my way that I could uh, affect the character of Laura Roslin or play her in a certain way or have her be a certain kind of president that young women and middle-aged women were projecting uh, hopefully onto Hillary or whoever it is that is is will be our first woman president someday and it was a very interesting position to answer to that and say uh, the humanity that I'm playing and the choices that I'm making may not be your ideal choice for your first female president or one that you love on television but um, I was going off on this long-winded answer again. Uh, it felt great. It taught me a lot and uh, sort of deepened my responsibility, particularly to younger women, because I've been brought uh, into this new generation uh, at a time when I, I didn't expect to be. And I was raised as a girl who was told she could do whatever she wanted, but I didn't quite believe it, and I'm beginning to. So I'm, uh, I feel privileged. Thank you. Speaking of pri privilege, uh, oh wait, you know, I, I'm we're going to give Ron just, the privilege just, of saying something. Yeah, just before we uh, wrap up, um, I just want to say something I've never really had a chance to do in a public forum like this, what I've always felt and, and said in private many times. Uh, David and I are often sort of um, lauded and sort of we, we get a lot of press and we sit in front of audiences and we talk about the show quite often and, and we're often talked about as the fathers of the show and yeah it's our property and you know we do this and it's our vision and this and that but the truth is there were really three of us that um, were at the creation of this show who were really important to guide the show from the very beginning and I just wanted for at least one time for uh, uh, an audience of people to stand up and really acknowledge the contribution and the vision of the director of the miniseries, of many of the most important episodes of this show, of the finale of this show, and who really deserves uh, a tremendous amount of credit and often is, is overlooked in these formats. And he's here tonight. So ladies and gentlemen, please stand with me and acknowledge Michael, Michael Reimer. Reimer.